Welcome to CS uh, 4510. The topic of today is on circuit complexity. So why are we studying circuit complexity? The reason we're studying circuit complexity is last time we talked about, um, you know, the relativization barrier. And we talked about how computations, if analyzed in a way that only involves simulation, perhaps in this sort of vibes-based analysis, it's not totally a formal proof barrier or something, but under this huge like very convincing heuristic, the P versus NP problem does not have a relativ relativizing proof. And that basically means most proofs that involve basically black box simulation of a computation, ones that require like, you simply look at input and output mappings, such proofs usually all relativize, such proofs are not sufficient. Computation therefore cannot be simply simulated, but must be deeply analyzed. Um, and one of the first, uh, things about this is the fact that, like, what does it mean to analyze a computation? What is the internals of a computation, okay? And unfortunately, the Turing machine model r hits us with a small barrier. So uh, here's a sort of guided uh, uh, analogy, a little a story. I was looking at pictures of mechanical Turing machines, and here's an example of one. Um, and basically, you can see this has got, like, oh, look at me. I'm writing my one. I'm writing a zero. I'm moving left and right. But importantly, a Turing machine is supposed to be a foundational computer. It's supposed to be a foundational model of computation. It's supposed to be a computer. But this is not a Turing machine as a foundational computer. This is a implementation of a Turing machine on top of an already existing computer. So what's that, that existing computer is like a Raspberry Pi or whatever. This is an electronic computer. This is not the Turing machine as a foundational computer, and then you implement a computer on top of the Turing machine. This is a Turing machine implemented on top of Boolean circuits. And as you look around, most of the hardware Turing machines appear to have this property. Oh, uh, no, not this guy, whatever. Most of the hardware Turing machines that people build have the property that they're built on like Raspberry Pi. Uh, come on, 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 come on. Okay, see? This guy uses Lego Connects thing, but guess what? It's not, it's, not, um, it's not a Turing machine. It's an implementation of a Turing machine on top of electronic components, which are built on Boolean circuits. There was one Turing machine I was able to find that did not have, uh, was not built upon Boolean circuits. And it was this guy's, no, nope, this guy's. He made a wooden Turing machine, completely out of wood. Um, it's powered by rotating a mechanical handle, and you see a sequence of levers and gears and, and things. And, the device has a simple tape, a small, of course the Turing machine has an unbounded tape, this has a bounded tape, and it's, it's got a transition function implemented as a sort of a set of pegs into a board, and that's your Q0, read zero, write one, move right, uh, go to QA kind of uh, implementation there. And it simply, you can see it, it has a, a tape head here, it has a, a sort of arm that grabs onto pegs and moves it. This is a reading device and it pushes down to determine if it's a zero or a one or a blank. And then it modifies that through this long arm over there to say that, yeah, the symbol was currently a, a zero or a one or whatever. And I gave, you know, as a final project, I was like, I have no idea what's going on here. Engineering wise, I have no clue uh, how this thing works, okay? I couldn't build this. So I gave it the final project for my 4510 students uh, in spring semester, and they got pretty close, but they still didn't understand how this thing works. This guy has some schematics online, and they're not perfect. And so I was like, I need to build one of these. Can you explain to me how this works? It's too hard. You see there's too many moving parts. It's too complicated. Um, anyway, there's only one such computer implementation of a real Turing machine that does not begin with Boolean circuits as a foundational computer. Now, why do I care about this? It's because circuits are so simple and so cool. You can do so many things with, with uh, circuits. This is an example of circuits with dominoes. You can use circuits, like when, after Alan Turing and including Claude Shannon, people were like, were like, I need to build a computer, you know? The motivating guy, the principle of building a computer, like, for fast calculation was to compute partial differential equations of stresses on airplane wings and things like this. You actually needed them practically as a calculator. This is an XOR gate implemented with dominoes. What you do is you knock down both pins, or one of the pins or other of the pins. The, these two inputs lead to one output. If one of them knocks over, the output will knock over, and that corresponds to a one. If that one knocks over, the output will knock, knock over, that corresponds to a zero. If neither of them knock over, it doesn't knock over. 
And if both of them knock over, they will cancel each other out, and neither of them will knock over. So this is an implementation of an XOR gate using um, uh, circuits. And in fact, you can impl these guys implemented, let's see, come on, talking, talking, let's see. They implemented a mechanical adder using simple dominoes. So you can see it's a sequence of gates and wires. So there's an XOR gate. You can implement an AND gate, an OR gate this way. And then they're going to keep going, and then the domino, and then the answer. This was like a four-bit adder, I guess, right? So yeah, it was, it was the right answer. Anyway, the, the point I'm trying to say is like, you know, it's really easy to build a circuit given physics principles. It's very difficult to build a Turing machine in a, in a certain way. And because why does this matter towards relativization? If you take a Turing machine and you break it in half, you now just have a broken Turing machine. But if you take a circuit and you break it in half, you now have two circuits. It's like a stick. If you break a stick, you have now doubled the numbers of sticks that you own. You know, That's true for circuits. It's not true for Turing machines. This, the fact that a circuit is built up of very small atomic pieces, which combine to be a larger computing device, is what makes them great to inspect inside. And you can look very deep inside a circuit and make several kinds of arguments. You can't do that for a Turing machine. A circuit is a very robust model of computation in the sense that a small perturbance to the circuit perhaps is, only has a small perturbance, possibly a small perturbance, uh, to the function it computes. But a small perturbance to a Turing machine, is, a Turing machine in some sense is not a robust computation. right? A small perturbance to a Turing machine may flip the accept state to a reject state. And now you've changed the entire language. It's not a small change to what's computed, you know, something like this. So after uh, the relativization barrier came out, complexity theorists spent the next several decades, well, like two and a half decades, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that ends, studying circuit complexity, right? It's fascinating that two models of computation basically came out of really two papers, one by uh, Alan Turing on, the, on uh, Turing machines and one by Claude Shannon on circuits, basically within a year of each other. Um, and let me give you a formal definition of a Boolean circuit. Everyone here is a CS major. Everyone knows what a Boolean circuit is. You've all taken 2110. You've had to actually program Boolean circuits. I'm going to give you a Boolean circuit. You tell me what this function computes, OK? It's going to have four input wires. You guys are perhaps familiar with this notation. Okay. The jellyfish is the AND gate, the space invader is the OR gate, and the pizza slice with a hat is a NOT gate, right? So given these four input wires, what do we think this Boolean function, this, excuse me, this circuit computes? Right. Are you guys familiar with these icons? I'm not uh, the best artist here, but we've seen these icons, perhaps. What does this function compute, like in human terms? Let's take a second. This is good practice to make sure we know what's going on. Yes. Yes. Zor over the four. You said Zor? Wow. I thought it was called XOR. Yeah. The Zor? OK. Yes, this is the XOR of n bits. This is x1, x2, xor, x3, xor, x4, Azor, 
uh, them. This is the XOR of four bits. Here's the reason for this. Inductively, you can think of, look at this. This, this is a subcircuit copied here three times. It computes something here, something here, something here, right? And if you think about it, it's going to just be, it, it'll be the disjunction. Um, it's going to, the, the output of this is going to end up being a one, uh, only if exactly one of these are on. And then from there, inductively, you have an argument. Now, there's an immediate problem we run into when we try to understand circuits. We're going to try and fit circuits into the definitions we have about decidability in languages. First off, this is a circuit of four bits. This is not a circuit of n bits or any number of bits. Circuits are what's called a non-uniform model of computation. A circuit, first of all, computes a function. And the function is called a Boolean function. A Boolean function is one which is simply a f takes on n bits, and it maps those to a single bit. Now, there are many, many, many Boolean functions. We'll give an estimate of that after the break. But a Boolean function is a fixed finite function. It is a function. It maps inputs to outputs. It's not a circuit. And you may think of a circuit as an implementation of a Boolean function. Um, a Boolean function, in the purest sense, you should think of as a truth table. And this is a circuit which implements that such a function. Now, the circuit being a non-uniform model of computation, what we mean by that is that a Turing machine takes on inputs of arbitrary size. But a circuit has four, this circuit has four bits. A 32-bit adder will correctly uh, decide exactly and only the circuits of, um, excuse me, a 32-bit adder will correctly add uh, numbers up to 32 bits. But it won't be able to add 200-bit uh, numbers and so on. So how do we model computation using circuits? And we use this non-uniformity condition, which is we define instead of a single circuit, we define an infinite circuit family. And a circuit family is a set of circuits, C0, C1, uh, such that C of, I, C of n has n input bits and one output bit, output wire. We'll say inputs, one output. Right. You define a circuit family to be an infinite set of circuits. Each circuit computes on the inputs of exactly n length n. Now, here's how you define a, a circuit family. We say a circuit family decides language L if uh, w is in L, if and only if, uh, the, the, the circuit of length, uh, the nth circuit on input w outputs a 1. Right. Here's a big difference immediately between uniform and non-uniform computation. A, a circuit, a, you know, a Turing machine, again, takes on, input, takes on input a word of any size and says yes or no. There's a fixed machine to do the entire language. Here, we have an infinite family of, function, of circuits. Each circuit is responsible for deciding only the strings of length n. Now, there's two important things here. First off, uh, the function which maps f of n to the encoding of the circuit n need not be computable. We would perhaps like to study circuit complexity in such a way that does not involve the cost required to synthesize a circuit. Get a, given a uniform computation, there's not an arbitrary, there's, does not imply that there's a way to compute what the nth circuit is. We don't want to measure the time it takes of synthesis of circuits, because in hardware, things are synthesized, and then, then you run them. We would like to measure complexity of a circuit. right? Um, what do you suggest that we measure uh, the complexity of a circuit with? There's several parameters you can do with circuits. What's a parameter? Yeah. Total number of gates. Yeah. That's the most obvious one. But there's like three more you could think of. Size of f of n is going to be uh, the class of languages decidable by circuit families uh, 
such that um, uh, the c of n has uh, less than or equal to f of n, we'll say o of f of n, uh, gates. The number of gates is bounded from above by f of n. Right? From here, we may define what, for example, a linear sized circuit is, what a polynomial sized circuit is. What a Can we have logarithmic sized circuits? Why not? It doesn't make sense, but why? Yeah. Because like the 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 elements of the circuit are like discrete units. So like well by logarithmic size circuit, what I mean is that the size of the circuit grows as a function of grows with a logarithm. Here's the answer I'm sort of looking for. A circuit has to a circuit has n inputs and one output. How can you you need like in the worst case like n over 2 circuits, n over 2 gates, at least for the n inputs, right? Unless you're just directly mapping an input and output to the input, then like I mean you need a few gates at least, right? The circuits are at least of linear size usually. Um, the circuit not only has to be linear size, the circuit has to at least be bigger has to be bigger than its input. Um, Here's, here's an observation. Like, this is kind of a, an interesting construction as a formal model. Like, think about the uniform model of computation is great because this is sort of how the world works way more than a non-uniform model of computation. Uh, think about Google. Google is one company, but they process the entire internet, right? Um, if the algorithm that Google runs on was, to, was supposed to be the size of the internet, does that, that would make it kind of ineffective and kind of ridiculous, right? Uniformity constraints are, are uh, important. And, but unfortunately, the only way we have to understand uh, circuits is through a non-uniformity condition. That's just sort of the nature of them being finite combinatorial objects. So theory and practice, the, there is a growing divide among like, how applicable some of the things we'll talk about today are. But know that we still we talk about them this way, right? Um, size f of n is the size of circuits of uh, f of n uh, size. Let's see if we can find a relationship between uniform time complexity and uh, circuit size. So for what functions do we think that uniform time is a subset of circuit size, if any? If you have a, by time, again, we're talking about uniform model computation. The Turing machine takes as input any number, any string and outputs of one or a zero. And a circuit, a size is a class of circuit families. So there's a set of infinitely many circuits, each one for a different size, and they grow as a function of whatever that function parameter is. The trade-off between these, it turns out that, uh, that the time, let's say time f of n, if you have a machine that runs in f of n time, the size of the circuit uh, it turns out is going to be f of n squared. Now, you can actually speed this up. You can actually construct such a circuit which runs in f of n log f of n, but we're going to do a lazier construction today. Right? Effectively, what this uh, theorem is going to say is it's not too bad for us to study circuits because we can still relate them. Not only can we relate them to uniform time, we can relate them efficiently to time. Right? Quadratic cost is nothing. What do we think the proof is going to look like? If I want to prove that time f of n is a strict subset, or a subset, excuse me, of size f of n, f squared of n, what is a proof, tech, what is a proof we should try? How would we go about this, first off? I guess the answer I'm looking for is um, the Cook-Levin theorem. 
The Cook Levin theorem encoded a NP machine into a, a CNF formula. We may apply a similar transformation as the Cook Levin theorem to convert a Turing machine, perhaps not non deterministic, deterministic Turing machine, into a polynomial size circuit. So that's simply what we'll, we'll do. And I'm going to give you, instead of doing the whole proof, I'm just going to say buy a construction similar to the Cook Levin theorem. What you would first do is map your set of symbols that can appear in a configuration that's a Q0, QH, uh, 0, 1, blank. You map these to some binary symbols like 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, um, I don't know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, right? You map some of these, you map your symbols uh, into a set of binary numbers. And then what you do is you basically create a tableau. You put Q0, 1, 1, blank, right? I'll do it like this way, 1, 1, 1, blank. What you do is you basically create a, a circuit of a certain size. We'll talk about the size in a second. Uh, and then you create a little gadget in between each of these wires like this, right? And this, this little gadget, you, I, perhaps you can believe, can be encoded into some Boolean circuits, ands, ors, and nots. That takes as input here, it takes on input nine of the previous wires and converts it to nine outputs in, in, that encode um, the next window uh, as per the Cook Levin theorem. And then for the rest of these, you'd put like these identity gates, right? Um, and then finally, the last one is going to be on the last row. Right? Um, if this machine runs in time f of n, what is, the, what is the height or the depth of this circuit? O of f of n. Yeah. It's going to be some constant overhead of O of f of n, right? What is the width of the circuit? In general, what, if the machine runs in f of n time, what is the width of the circuit supposed to be? Absolutely. Yeah. It's the space, and because it has an f of n time bound, it has f of n space bound. So in fact, this circuit is O of f of n by O of f of n. It's, prob it's approximately O of f squared of n time. So, excuse me, size. And perhaps some large constants dependent upon implementation details of the alphabet and so on, right? Now, I'm not going to actually do the construction of such a circuit. I'm just hopefully uh, alluding to that we, the reason we did the Cook 11 theorem in such detail is so from here you can wave your wand and say, yeah, I could probably do all that programming with and or not gates. I'm not going to, but I could probably do it and still get good, good, good estimates on the size, right? Um, two comments. First, the speed up of making this f of n log f of n basically comes from a different kind of Turing machine simulation, which uh, is called an oblivious Turing machine. And what that allows you to do is notice that most of the uh, gates on each level are unary, or excuse me, not unary, but identity gates. So you save up, it's not really a full circuit. It's almost like a little constant amount per depth of the circuit. That's sort of where the f of n log f of n comes from. The second thing is like it should it it may be surprising to you that circuits are Turing complete, or it may not be surprising to you that circuits are Turing complete, because personally, I didn't think circuits were Turing complete, even though like every computer ever has used circuits. Circuits first off don't have storage; they don't have RAM. Like so, what can they really do? I thought they did some sort of strict limited combinatory process, but it turns out circuits are Turing complete. This is also serves as a proof: not only are circuits Turing complete, but they're efficient, right? There's Turing complete on the, on the kinds of computations we care about, which is those that halt on all inputs. If you have a machine that halts on all inputs, it has a circuit to do that, same thing. Um, so the question is, okay, like, well, circuits don't have memory. They don't have RAM. Where do they keep track of information? And in fact, they do have memory. They do have RAM. The RAM, the storage, the working storage of a, of a Boolean circuit are, is where? It's going to be the intermediary. It's going to be the intermediary wire values of the circuit. If you were to take a multimeter and like probe it while the circuit is computing, you would see changes on the intermediary wire values at different depths according to exactly how a RAM, uh, a real uh, x86 PC, may change its RAM. You know, those end up being the same thing. So circuits not only efficient, uh, but not only Turing complete, but are efficient. 
very, very efficient, right? Um, but importantly, circuits, as we mentioned previously, nice and combinatorial, not any of the ugly properties that uh, some breaking up a Turing machine have. So perhaps it, it, it's, it's thought that um, Turing machines, uh, that circuits may avoid the relativization barrier. And certainly they do. We talked about the theorems last time. Which, which theorems do we think do not relativize? And the only ones we could think of maybe up to debate are you know, P-space being, uh, uh, excuse me, TQBF being P-space complete and the cook levin theorem did not appear to relativize, right? The, this is, circuits you know, are really deep into that. They appear not to relativize for the same reasons. All right, questions on the circuit theorem? Okay, I'm going to give you, um, we're going to take a small detour and talk about something else for a second, and then we'll uh, lead it back into circuits, I promise. So we, uh, you know, theorists have always come up with models of computation and then tried to argue about if those are good models or not. Uh, one of the such models is called an advice machine. An advice machine is a machine that's been given a finite string, and the string is supposed to help it compute it. Now, this, it has no choice of how the string is given to it, but the string is given, the length of the string given is a function of the length of the input it's currently running on and not the input itself. So for example, we may write C slash F to, be, to mean the class of languages uh, of C machines given access to a string of length F, where F is a function of N, where N is the machine's input. So a machine given a longer input, running on a longer input, may be given access to longer advice. The advice, again, I'll stress, is not chosen as a function of the input, but only as a function of the input length. Some quick algebra things we can do. C0 uh, is going to be what? C. Yeah. If you have a machine, you give it no advice, it does the same power. Um, what about uh, if uh, F is majorized by G? What can we say about C of F and C of G? What is the relationship between C of F and C of G? Set. More advice, more power, right? How much advice is too much power? Consider uh, we took polynomial time and we augmented it by exponential, uh, exponential advice. How big is 2 to the n advice? Think about anything you could possibly decide given 2 to the n. Now, a machine does not know what your input is, but it knows what, how, how long your input is. And it's going to choose a string to put on your advice tape for you. You then get to read this advice tape knowing about what it's supposed to mean. How much, how big do we think P uh, with 2 to the n advice is? Sigma star. Sigma star is one language. Like the power set of sigma star. This is an uncountable complexity class. Why is it power set of sigma star? Because you look at the length, like your, like the machine giving the advice, like looks at the length of the input and then just outputs all of the answers for every single polynomial. Like every yeah. Input of that size. So the two to the n advice would be the characteristic string of the finite, like let L be any language in power set of sigma star. Then the advice would be L intersect sigma to the n, is some string of length n. Right? You say, here's my advice. It's 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. Right? Whatever. And it, that, that bit is determined if the ith string of length n is in the language or not in the language. And that would be a machine to the side of that language. Um, consider like P given F if F is 1 infinitely often. Depends on what the actual language is, but certainly we can say that uh, given such advice, um, P contains undecidable languages, certainly. So we see even actually a little bit of advice goes a very long way, like really long way. In fact, sometimes people study classes like, you'll study a class and you'll like, okay, I have one bit of advice, you know, something like this. And that ends up changing the whole problem. Advice is quite powerful. Um, 
What about P with one bit of advice? What do, what do, what do we think P is with one bit of advice? First off, P is contained in P with one bit of advice, right? Why? Why is P a subset of uh, P with one bit of advice? Just ignore the advice. Ignore the advice. Uh, why? What do we think? I'll, I'll say P with one bit of advice is actually contained in P. Is your advice is only dependent on the length of the. Is it? Is, it's a constant, actually. So yes, it is. It can be dependent here. It's not. Well, like it's the. Oh, okay, never mind. You you just, just, yeah, you could ahead. just split it into two polynomial like p's, one which treats it as if it has zero, and one which treats it as, as one. One of those will be right, and one of those will decide the language in polynomial time. Which one? Don't know, non-constructively, but one of them will. So QED. Too small advice is not good. Is too small. Um, the reason I'm bringing up advice machines is that we are concerned with polynomial size circuits. But um, the notation we use for polynomial size circuits does not is not in fact size poly. It turns out that size poly, which is polynomial size circuits, is actually equal to the class of languages of polynomial time advice machines with polynomial advice. This is surprising. We should not just pull the audience. I don't expect a right answer on this. P slash poly, do we expect to be equal to P? Off the top of our head, why not? Give me an argument against it. P slash poly, using the advice definition, why is P slash poly probably not P? Because it seems like p slash constant is the same as p, and p slash poly feels bigger than that. OK. What about p slash log? OK. We'll, we'll, we'll think about it in a second. Once we prove the equality of these two classes, uniform machines with advice, non-uniform circuits of polynomial size, uh, then we'll drop this notation, and we'll only call this class p slash poly. Now, how do you prove two sets are equal? You do a double set containment. So we're going to do a double set containment with this. And this is such a, I think it's such a beautiful, simple proof. You could probably figure this one out on your own. Let's do uh, this way first. Why is p slash poly contained in size poly? Size poly is polynomial size circuits. By polynomial size circuits, what I mean is like, uh, like what I really mean is size. Poly to be the union of k is equal to 0 to infinity of size n to the k, right? Why is p slash poly a subset of size poly? Let's see if you guys can figure this one out. Because p slash poly is a subset, like if I fix a specific end of the k, okay. the k slash like end of the k is a subset of like time n to the k plus one, and then you have like a telescoping Ooh. thing. Like certainly the advice cannot give you more than an entire larger like polynomial order. I mean, the advice can be anything. It could be. Some answers to an undecidable language, even, right? Right, but like, it's still like some function. Here's the answer I'm looking for two words it's Cook Levin. Okay, so given a polynomial time, a polynomial advice, mach advice machine, we're gonna convert it into a polynomial size circuit. Um, Maybe you were alluding into that direction. By the way, next time the answer is Cook Levin, you guys have to get it. Okay, this one was Cook Levin. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a polynomial size circuit. I'm going to redo that construction, which I have not erased from the board. But instead of a polynomial time Turing machine, I'm doing a polynomial size advice machine, a polynomial time advice machine. Okay, 
this is going to again have q0, 1, 1, 1, 1, whatever, right? And we have our little gadgets and so on, right? And then on the, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have our advice here. We're going to call it a1 to a, let's say, poly, OK? If a, if this is a p slash poly machine, oh, excuse me, I haven't finished the circuit. We're going to wire up the advice bits into how they're read into the circuit, right? Something like this. Wherever the algorithm, the advice machine would read the ith bit of advice, we simply wire that ith bit of advice into it. Okay. Um, now, uh, what's the size of this circuit? Well, the height of the circuit, the depth of the circuit, excuse me, is poly. The the width of the circuit, as we've discussed previously, is going to be poly. And this is going to be polynomial size advice. So we're going to get poly uh, times poly plus poly, which is just polynomial QED. So we see the advice machine is uh, a polynomial size circuit, QED. Questions on the, this direction of the proof? Almost uncreative. I haven't even uh, filled in the details on how exactly that wiring up would work, but I'll leave it to you to figure out, right? Wait, okay, but like, why does the circuit just get the poly, like, get the advice for free? I just plugged it in there. I wired it up. That's a bunch of hard-coded bits, whatever that advice was supposed to be. It's going to read it. The advice... What, whoever the advice god is is going to place those bits onto the circuit for us. I see. So we're assuming that like, like the circuits also have advice. Like we're not comparing. Ah, no, the circuit does not have advice because here it's an input. It's not an advice circuit. It's a circuit. I see. The circuit, the, the advice, so formally, like to an automata specifica specification level, the polynomial size, the polynomial time advice machine has a second tape which has this string hard-coded onto it for it on the beginning of execution, and it should know where to look in the string. It doesn't know what the str where the string is, but it maybe knows how to, how to read it appropriately. I'm going to go look at the jth bit, and that's going to tell me the answer I need, something like this, right? So same thing. That computation can be converted to a circuit. When it says, I'm going to read the jth bit, it's going to, we're just going to wire up that jth bit for it. We assume that the circuit like, has access to this advice. Um, suppose I created an infinite family of circuits, one for each possible advice string. Right. All of those are... One of those are going to be it, non-constructively. This is, yeah, it's, it's the cook Levin feature again, yeah. Questions on this direction? Okay, the second direction I claim is more satisfying. And uh, the second direction, oh, I still have my diagram here. We want to prove that... Uh, Languages that have polynomial size circuit families all can be decided by polynomial time advice machines give polynomial size advice. Why is this true? It's almost like a one sentence answer. Again, showing containment of one class and the other. In the class that's bigger, you always want to describe an algorithm of that class, right? So you say, let L be in this class, we show this thing is to be true, right? So let L be a class that has uh, polynomial size circuit families. What is a polynomial time advice machine of polynomial advice to decide that same language? The advice is the circuit. The advice is the circuit. That's almost word for word. The, that's exactly what I was thinking. Here's their advice machine. Advice machine. Uh, let's say on input W and advice A. Serialized circuit. Uh, from the advice, simulate a C on W and return that. So the advice provided to the, uh, the polynomial size advice provided to the uh, advice machine is going to be a description of the polynomial size circuit of the input of length n. Given the circuit of length n, it's going to be able to simulate the circuit on the input W and then just return if that returns correctly. Right? Because the circuits exist of polynomial size, you can give this machine polynomial sized advice, which is this polynomial sized circuit, and then it just uh, simulates the circuit on it, right? Really, the power of having an answer here, the advice is really, really something else, you know? This, is, this could not have been done easily without the advice, right? But given the advice, it works. 
Questions on that proof? I think that's a satisfying one to find out. Um, from here, we may conclude that uh, size poly is the si is uh, equal to this class uh, p slash poly, and then we drop the notation. We won't ever call it size poly again. Questions on that? All right, let's contrast uh, p uh, and p slash poly. Um, what is uh, p? Is p equal to p slash poly or not equal to p slash poly? Certainly, p is a subset of p slash poly. Why is p a subset of p slash poly? Can once again just ignore the advice. Ignore the advice. Using the advice definition, you simply ignore the advice. Why is, but if we use the circuit definition, we proved f of n, uh, time f of n is in size f of n squared. So square of a polynomial is a polynomial. So using the circuit definitions is also still true. I claim, in fact, these are strict. Why should they be strict? You can like hard code in random noise <laughs> that is incomputable. Uh, it would take some conjectures about randomness and a buildup of that. Because what if the machine has some um, something that the pseudo random number generator or something in it? But it's not pseudo random. It is random. It's, what if its behavior is indistinguishable from randomness? That's true only if p does not equal np. Well, such a thing doesn't exist because then it's not random. If something something sufficiently Kolmogorovly complex, you could just you could just hard code a really long string and then have uh, accept all things of length. Like some length n. So the machine's behavior, on. though, has to be distinguishable from that of a polynomial machine without this random advice. Yeah. Uh, but that's only true if randomness gives power. And that's only true if we'll, we'll say b equals ppp. I'll talk about randomness in a second. But um, this is not something I expected anyone to get. But does anyone have any other conjectures why this is true? Um, one of the reasons is actually p slash poly is not a decidable class. p slash poly actually contains undecidable languages, which is kind of an insane fact. Uh, here's two facts. Um, uh, all unary languages have poly psi circuits. That's only true really by a size like a encoding thing because unary is so much worse than um, uh, binary. This language u halt one to the m comma w, where that's some number encoding m and w. M halt on w. Uh, u halt is a unary language, and so therefore u halt is in uh, p slash poly. But u halt will never be in p because p is a subset of the decidable languages, right? There are, in fact, some other decidable languages like xp time, complete languages, unary, whatever, that are in p slash poly and not in p. Um, this makes it a really weird class. Like, how would you even draw or think about that? You got p, you got np, you got p space. Uh, what goes next? XP. If P, these are all subsets of the decidable languages. So how would you really draw X, P slash poly here? You kind of don't. What this is like the closest we can do. It's not a nice picture. So when you draw a complexity class Venn diagrams, it usually does not include non-uniform complexity classes. It does not include P slash poly because that's not a very nice looking diagram, right? Um, Here's an interesting question for you. Do you think NP is a subset of P slash poly? Okay. 
What are the implications if NP is contained in P slash poly? Or excuse me, what are the implications if, M if NP is not contained in P slash poly? Yeah, P is a subset of P slash poly, and therefore, if NP is not contained in P slash poly, then P cannot equal NP, right? So there are connections between uniform and non-uniform complexity classes. That's certainly one. We'll talk about another interesting complex, uh, situation next time called the Karpolipotent theorem, which is an implication of what happens if NP does, is contained in P slash poly. Um, if NP is contained in P slash poly, bad things happen. And if NP is not contained in P slash poly, things also happen. And so this is as open of a question as any of the others, right? Um, one last thing I want to talk about is just sort of a quick segue on randomness. Um, so Avi Wigerson recently won the Turing Award. I want to talk about one of his theorems, uh, sort of way too high level. There's this class called BPP. Uh, BPP stands for Bounded Error Probabilistic Polynomial Time, Two-Sided Error. And it's called bounded error because given an, uh, you know, a randomized algorithm of bounded error, you can perform am amplification. And ampli you can amplify the error to make it arbitrarily small by running the algorithm several times and then taking majority votes, right? So BPP, and I won't get too formal about this. This is just sort of a small segue. BPP is this class of probabilistic polynomial time, but bounded error, two-sided. It's not zero error, one-sided, or anything like this. Um, there, there are, there's like five different randomized complexity classes and different measures. Two-sided error, bounded. So amplification in polynomial time will decrease the uh, error exponentially, right? BPP, it turns out, is contained in p slash poly. Why do we think that to be true? This is called Edelman's theorem. Why is BPP, if you had to make a, a loose conjecture, let me formalize BPP for you in a different sentence. A, a BPP is a Turing machine that uh, has a random, has a, a, a string of randomness on it. It has a second tape full of random bits already for it. And a mach uh, the machine accepts if two thirds of its branches accept in a sort of a non deterministic way. It has to take a majority of its branches to accept boundedly uh, for the machine to accept the word. Why would BPP be a subset of P slash poly? In a loose way, like uh, without getting too much detail, what you can basically do is you can quote, quote unquote, like pull out the randomness. The you can get the machine to accept by giving it a polynomial amount of you can a random machine can be simulated deterministically with only a polynomial amount of advice, right? So you can tell the machine exactly what random what it, what it would rely on randomness for. You can give it as a sequence of choices. In fact, the advice could be just the random string, something like this, right? Sort of. There's some missing details in that, but that's basically the loose idea. So what about P versus BPP, right? Do we think P is a strict subset of BPP or not? Let's, P certainly is contained in BPP because every unrandomized algorithm, P again, deterministic complexity class of efficient computation, BPP is a good class of randomized algorithms, like good measure of them. Do we think this containment is strict or not? Let's hear some votes. I'm asking you, in, in some sense, are, do there exist problems which cannot be done deterministically, efficiently, but can be done in randomized polynomial time efficiently? Yes. Why? I think the randomness at taking a majority vote is an analog for non-determinism. And as you take your randomness like larger and larger and larger, what you're essentially doing is like hoping that you pick the appropriate computation path, but just like doing some scaling so that like you're like pretty likely to pick that computation path. Like the analog between the lucky coin and the randomness, I think there's yeah. something there. There's something there. So would you would you conjecture BPP equals NP? Uh, I don't know. Maybe, like maybe there's some randomness, but like uh, if I had to give an answer, like sure, why not? All right. For a long, long time, people thought BPP. Yeah, Joseph. Why? Randomization is like, I think, I think a lot of 
randomized algorithms, you can like sort of approximate with like, you know, like some pseudo random number generator and like a good seed or something is my intuition. So I, I struggle to imagine a problem where true randomness is better than pseudo randomness. So uh, I'll give you both sides. I think you both have good intuition here. And that's the reason I'm presenting this result. This is, this is uh, one of uh, Wigdrus's great celebrated theorems. People believed B, P did not equal BPP for a very long time, simply because of the power of randomized algorithms. They had all these randomized algorithms for problems, but they didn't have polynomial counterparts for them. You know, Primality testing, Rabin Miller primality testing is a randomized algorithm you could explain to high schoolers. We didn't have a, a we didn't have a deterministic polynomial time uh, primality testing algorithm until, until 2004, you know, and it was a derandomization procedure on that. So there are many such algorithms that appear to be in BPP but not in P, right? On the other hand, this error amount appears so they appear different. But on the other hand, derandomization results exist and they exist in very limited ways, but they do exist. So can, basically, can every algorithm be efficiently derandomized? And we haven't done a very deep discussion about what BPP is, and we won't. But I just want to—I just want to mention this because Abby Wigerson won the Turing Award, and I'm the biggest fanboy. Uh, and Pliazzo and Wigerson in 2004, uh, 2002 uh, showed uh, if E and E again is this class, which is uh, of time uh, of 2 to the n, and n is a linear exponent. It's not exp, it's just a linear exponent of time. If E requires exponential size circuits, and that ought to be true, then uh, B, P is equal to BPP. So now, this is a, one of the celebrated theorems from 2002. Basically, if E requires exponential size circuits, we have good derandomization procedures. We have perfect derandomization techniques. So people now have to hedge their bets. Do you believe intuitively with your use of computation, does, does randomization give effective power against P, or would you expect E to have exponential size circuits? You now have to weigh those two options against each other. I think most people would agree that E has to take exponential size circuits. Like Today we proved linear time is in quadratic size and so on, right? So could you do exponential time in perhaps sub-exponential size circuits? Uh, I don't think so. No one thinks that. No one, there's no reason for anyone to ever believe that. But if that is true, if E does require exponential size circuits, then you could prove P, then you could have you have a procedure for good derandomization. We don't have practical derandomization. Derandomization works in very specific contrived scenarios if at all, and it usually doesn't. So we believe actually P equals BPP, but we can't prove it. In fact, the reason I'm mentioning this, this is a circuit lower bound argument, connection to derandomization, right? Very broad sweeping connections between complexity uh, branches. You have proof complexity, randomization, and derandomization. You have interaction. You have intelligence. You have all these people. And then the great theorems are the ones that cross barriers. You know? This is a connection between, again, circuit lower bounds and randomiz randomized algorithms, right? Crazy that the, 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 this is one of them, but right. Any questions? Yes. Does that show that if E doesn't require exponential size circuits, then P does not equal BPP? Well, the contrapositive would be if P does not equal BPP, if you have a provable algorithm, if you have an algorithm which provably cannot be derandomized, then you, E does not require exponential size circuits. Now, this E requires exponential size circuits may be a slightly more technical thing, you would have to actually read the paper and figure out what's going on in there. It may be like uh, 2 to the n minus 1. There's a, there's a, there is a result that says if for every exponential sized circuit you can save a single AND gate, then P equals NP. Something like this exists. You know? So I'm sure the argument, the, the sentence I've written on the board, E requires exponential sized circuits, might be slightly more technical. And with the negation of that is a little more involved. But in spirit, yeah. If, random, if re derandomization does not exist, then maybe circuits can be done too quickly. Circuits are can be done better than time. Something like this. Right. Questions? All right. Take a little break. <laughs>